This PowerPoint reviews and expands upon some of the key budgeting concepts covered in this week's lesson. First, recall that a budget is both a financial plan and a legal document. As a financial plan, it specifies the amount of financial and related resources, including dollars, staffing, materials, allocated to individual activities, programs, and organizational units. As such, it expresses the decisions, priorities, and preferences of the governing body that adopted the budget. As a legal document, the budget establishes an absolute limit on the amount of financial resources that can be spent on particular activities, programs, or units. These legal limits are called appropriations. You should recall that we ran into the word appropriations in the first part of the course when we were recording the budget itself into the accounting system. Managers cannot exceed appropriations without going back to the governing body and requesting a revision of the budget. There are different formats for organizing a budget. That is, there are different ways in which the appropriations can be organized in the budget document itself. The first method is a line item budget. Under a line item budget, appropriations are organized by the type of expenditure or expense. For example, salaries, benefits, materials, rent, travel, fuel, etc. Under responsibility center budget, appropriations are organized by organizational unit, departments, agency, or division. And under a program budget, appropriations are grouped into activities that are focused on the accomplishment of a particular goal or closely related group of goals. Looking at our fire department, if it were to adopt a line item budget, it might look something like this. Total appropriations broken down by salaries and benefits, fuel, supplies, utilities, miscellaneous, and the total. The advantage of a line item budget is that it's very easy to use throughout the year. When it comes time to purchase supplies, it's very easy to look in the supply account and determine whether there are sufficient appropriations remaining to make a proposed purchase. If our fire department was to use a responsibility center budget, its appropriations might be organized as shown. Fire broken down by fire station and a separate appropriation line for headquarters. Advantage of responsibility center budgets is that it's very easy to pinpoint responsibility for managing a particular appropriation line. The appropriation for fire station one is the responsibility of the head of fire station one and it would be his or her responsibility to keep expenditures in line with the appropriations. Many organizations use a combination of line item and responsibility center budgeting. If our fire department did this, its budget might look something as shown, with its appropriations first broken down by fire station, and within the fire station broken down further by line item, salary and benefits, fuel, etc. Program budgets are less common. If our fire department used a program budget, it might look something like this, with its appropriations broken down into its major activities, uh, fire prevention, which would include inspections and uh, public education programs and other activities aimed at preventing fires from starting in the first place. Fire suppression, which is actually responding to calls for actual fires as they occur. Emergency medical services, responding to calls for emergency medical service needs of the public. And, and administration to cover some of the central headquarters activities. This type of budget is sometimes difficult to do because Individual expenditures don't, are often difficult to allocate to particular programs. For example, a firefighter's salary 
might include activities uh, in fire prevention, fire suppression, and emergency medical service. And it might be hard to allocate the dollar cost of that salary to these different activities. Also, um, there usually is not a specific manager in responsible for each of these activities and therefore it's harder to pinpoint responsibility for managing expenditures within these individual appropriation accounts. There are also different processes for developing a budget. Process refers to the method the organization goes through to determine the appropriate appropriations amount to be included in each account in the budget. So don't confuse this with the format of the budget which we just talked about. This is a process or a method or an approach or technique for actually determining what is the best number to have in each appropriation account. The first process is incremental budgeting. Under incremental budgeting, the new budget is based upon the prior year budget, adjusted for inflation or other known changes in costs. So for example, if it was our fire department, we would take last year's budget, we would adjust the salary line to reflect the, the anticipated salary increases to be given to firefighters during the year. We might also adjust that line um, to include the salary costs associated with additional firefighters that we might be bringing online to staff a new fire station if that was to occur. We would also adjust the fuel line uh, for anticipated changes in gasoline prices, etc. Incremental budgeting is very easy to use, does not take much time, um, and is very advantageous in that respect. But it does not work very well in cases where uh, the organization's environment or its goals are changing significantly. Flexible budgeting you might have run into in your cost accounting class. Under flexible budgeting, a different budget is developed based on assumptions of different levels of service to be provided. Flexible budgeting is used in corporations, is used in some not-for-profit organizations, and may be used in governments for some of their enterprise funds. It's generally not used for the core government itself, uh, as captured in the general fund and the governmental funds, primarily because the revenues which fund appropriations for the government are determined from tax revenues and can't be increased significantly during the year if the level of service to be delivered changes. So if the level of service demanded by the public in a particular governmental activity increases significantly, the appropriations account usually are not adjusted. So flexible budgeting usually wouldn't be appropriate. Performance budgeting links inputs, budgeted resources, to outputs and outcomes of the government. Um, so the way under this process, the government would first determine what it intends to accomplish during the year, and then go back and determine what specific resources it believes would be necessary to accomplish those objectives. Zero-based budgeting is very similar to performance budgeting, um, but in zero-based budgeting, the total budgeted amount must be re-justified every year for every organizational unit. Performance budgeting and zero-based budgeting take a lot of time and a lot of staff resources. Many organizations will use a combination of incremental budgeting and performance budgeting using incremental budgeting for sort of the core governmental activities that don't change much from year to year and are not subject to significant change in their operating environment or in terms of their objectives. While the organization would apply performance budgeting or zero-based budgeting to new programs or to programs that are um, subject to changing objectives or environmental conditions.
When an organization uses performance budgeting or zero-based budgeting, it will usually include performance measures or indicators in its budget. Performance measures or indicators are quantitative expressions of the goals to be accomplished in the budget year. They generally include both a unit of measure and a specific target to be met. They're most easily interpreted if they're combined with not just a target for the budget year, but specific data on historical levels of performance for the same measure, or performance levels for a peer organization or a similar organization. And performance measures may include both financial and non-financial measures. And in fact, generally, most of them are non-financial in nature. Types of performance measures or indicators. Performance measures or indicators may be input measures, output measures, outcome measures, or efficiency measures. Input measures are the amount of resources used to provide a service. The budget itself, or the appropriations of the budget itself, are actually an input measure. Output measures measure the number of units of service provided by the organization. They're generally easy to measure. Managers like to use output measures, but they don't always provide a good picture of whether the organization is accomplishing its objectives or not. Also, they can be easily manipulated by a manager and therefore may not be as reliable as one would hope. Outcome measures are important and can be superior to output measures. They focus on the results that the organization is seeking to accomplish, and they describe the impact that the organization is having on its clients, its environment, and the public. And they would include measures of public safety, public health, and most importantly, of the quality of service delivered to the public. Finally, efficiency measures. Efficiency measures represent the cost or resources used per unit of outcome or output. They are often very useful com for comparing one organization to another. So lastly, if our fire department was to put together performance measures for its budget, they might look something like this. Note that the mission of the fire department is to protect public health and safety and to protect private property. The first three measures are output measures, the number of inspections performed, the number of fire call responses, and the number of emergency medical services. They provide an important indicator of the department's activities, but they don't provide a complete picture of its effectiveness in its completion of its goal and meeting of its mission. The last four measures are outcome measures and provide a more complete picture of the extent to which the fire department is uh, meeting its mission of protecting public health and safety and private property. The average response time for fire calls and emergency medical calls measures the quality of service. The value of private property destroyed by fire, which is measured by insurance companies, shows how effective the fire department has been has in reducing fires and in suppressing them quickly. And citizen approval ratings could also measure how the public itself views the quality of service provided by the department. So we see that a, a, the best picture of the fire department's performance is provided by a combination of outcome and output measures. The fire department might also add some efficiency measures to provide an even better picture.